So uh, Peggy's chosen these next two songs as a couple of her favorites. Um, I have to confess, I'm a bit rusty with the first one. And you know when you get a mental block on a song and you, you sing the line wrong. So if I don't sing the last line of each verse, please bear with me. But you guys go over the top of me and sing it loud because I'll probably mislead you otherwise. But it's just a reminder, first of all, Jesus has created everything. And when he looked at it all, isn't it, he said it's, it's good. It's very good. So all things bright and beautiful, first of all. Father, we thank you for everything you've made, and you made it so well. Thank you, Jesus, for sharing this incredible creation with us. And we just thank you as we're about to sing, Lord. It wasn't below you to step into this creation, to rescue us when we made it all go wrong because of our sin. Lord Jesus, we thank you this time of year we can remember that. You stepped in as that tiny baby. You grew, you gave your life for us on the cross, Lord, to save us. And we thank you for that, Lord. Amen. We'll sing our next song. And this, I think this is our first Christmas carol of the year. And it's just reminding us that creation, the maker of it, was willing to be made one of us to come and save us. Once in Royal David City. Amen. 
thank you for that amazing good news and that carol lord that one day we'll see you in all your glory and those that trust in you lord will be given everlasting life and we just thank you for the hope lord please speak to us now as we have the reading from the bible lord please speak to us and please just explain what you've said to us so all of us can understand amen okay please be seated it's interesting, Brian uh, mentioned about people carrying burdens and all sorts of things. This time of year is an amazing time of year for lots, isn't it? But it's also a hard time of year for so many. And I know so many are carrying burdens, wrestling with all sorts of things. So we're going to have a Christmas reading. You might think, how are we going to cover that? Because I've come to church and I need help maybe, or I'm, I'm struggling with some big things, or I'm just happy. It's Christmas time. And Peggy's being baptized. How are we going to cover all that in one go? Well, I can't, but Jesus can. And the reading we have might be a surprising Christmas reading because it's not one that's chosen very often, but it is full of treasure because it's God's word. So Yvonne is going to read to us. Thanks, Yvonne. Today's reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 1. This is 1 to 6, and then 14 to 16. It's page number 681 in the Bibles in front of you. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And then verses 14 to 16. Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Eliad, Eliad the father of Eliza. Eliza, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thank you so much, Yvonne. It's probably one of the, I mean this with all respect, it's probably one of the worst Bible readings to be given because of all the names. So thank you, you did an amazing job. Um, obviously, it's all God's word, and that's what we need. So it's not a bad reading in that sense. But let's, let's pray uh, that God would help us, and then we're going to look at that short section together. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what you've done in Peggy's life we can celebrate with her today and we just pray as we look at what you've done if you've done the same thing in our lives if you've saved us Jesus we pray you'd help us to rejoice and just see again how amazing you are 
Lord, if there are any here who are not Christians, who don't know you, please talk to them, Lord, and help them to see what's happened in Peggy's life can happen in theirs if they would just call on your name. So please help us today, we pray. Amen. Okay, basically what we just read is a list of names, isn't it? Some of them no one's called anymore. Some of them, if you remember back to Sunday school, you might have heard. Some of them, if you're a regular Bible reader, you'll know a bit more about. Hopefully you recognize the last one, Jesus, who's called Christ. But basically it's a list, isn't it? And I know this time of year... There's, it's played over and over and over again. Please don't sing it, but I'm just going to quote it, so please bear with me. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and nice. Who's coming to town? Santa Claus is coming to town. It's the song we hear, isn't it, over and over. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good, for goodness sake. That's the the tone of the song, isn't it? So we've heard that. He's making a list. Do you remember hearing that or watching films as a youngster maybe thinking, I hope I'm on the nice list. I hope I make it. I hope somehow all the good I've done this year, even though it's probably, honestly, not very much, outweighs all the bad which, if I'm honest, is probably quite a lot, but I'm hoping somehow I can cover it and I make the list. And there's all sorts of lists, aren't there? Lists of names that we hope will be on. I'm sure you've had them all through your life. As a, as a child, I wanted my name on the football team list in school. The PE teacher comes out and they stick it on the board. Is my name on that list? Because it matters, doesn't it? It means something. Am I going to be playing? Am I going to be enjoying football? Am I going to feel all left out because my name's not on the list? You could have all sorts of lists. Some people want to be on that richest... Is it Forbes' list of richest people in the world? And it changes, isn't it? They want to be number one on that. So give their whole life to getting money and, and everything they can just to try and climb up that list. Maybe it's just simply on Facebook or social media or something, isn't it? You hope someone tags your name. You want to be noticed. You want someone just to notice you're there. You want to be popular. Maybe you want to go for, to be on loads of people's lists, to be liked a million times. But all of us, church runs on lists, doesn't it? We've got a list at the back to, sa- to, to sign up for Sam and Kathy. Who's cleaning? Who's on coffee? All these lists all over the place, and some of them are good, isn't it? And we want to be on them, and when we're not on them, we feel gutted. But somehow we can live our lives by the sentiment, by the feeling in that song, isn't there? Isn't that what we'd say to the children, if we're honest, isn't it? For goodness sake, be nice. That's what we say, isn't it? Have we ever actually stopped for a minute to think, what are we actually asking them to do? We're actually asking them to do something impossible, aren't we? What was the first thing you felt like doing when your parents said, for goodness sake, be nice? The opposite, wasn't it? Or if you see a sign saying, do not touch. Mm. What's come in next, you know, isn't it? So we're at, we say, for goodness sake, try and be good. And that's, that's the sentiment of that song, isn't it? If you are good enough, you'll make Santa Claus's list. But if you're not good enough, if you're on the naughty list, forget it. Well, what about this? Here's my take. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He already knows we're all sinful, not nice. Jesus Christ is coming to town. He does see you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows that you've been bad, not good. Is there any hope? Please let there be for my sake. Jesus really is making a list. He has a list, physical list. 
This is part of it that we read today. But he has a list, and he's making a list. But if all that's true, if he sees me when I'm sleeping, if he sees me when I'm awake, if he sees all the thoughts in my head, and all the feelings I have about other people, and all the selfish things I've done, and he knows that ultimately in my heart I've done wrong, I'm sinful, well, who, who is going to make that list? Is it even possible to get my name on that list? Maybe you're thinking here today, you've come into church, and you're like, I'm not good enough to be a Christian. Lots of people say that. I'm not good enough. I haven't been nice enough. I couldn't try and be nice enough. I couldn't. I need someone to, like, change me from the inside out. Maybe you look at Jesus' list and you think, I could never make it. Maybe you feel hopeless. But the good news is Jesus' list is the opposite to Santa Claus's list. The names we read there might not mean much to you, but if you read who makes Jesus' list, it's quite shocking. Let's just go through a couple. Abraham, he's the first on the list. Normally, if your name's first on the list, you're picked first, aren't you? Like, yes, number one. Do you know what Abraham did? He lied that he was married to his wife to save his own skin. Not once, twice. How selfish is that? He's top of the list. Jacob in the Bible, if you read about Jacob, he's third on the list. Jacob manipulated everybody around him. He tricked his dad, who was old and blind, He created a massive family rift. He betrayed his brother and his brother wanted to kill him. He ran away. He deceived his uncle. And he spent most of his life manipulating everything, trying to manipulate everyone around him to get what he wanted. And in the end, he had a fight with God. He made the list. That's crazy, isn't it? Number one and number three. That's what they were like. Well, it goes on. Judah. Judah used a woman badly and then tried to have her murdered. He made the list. What? Rahab. She was a prostitute in a city that was terrified. She sold herself. She's on the list. Does this make any sense? Ruth, she belonged to a group of people in a country that just hated God. They were God's enemies, and they used to fight the church all the time. She's on the list. Doesn't make any sense, does it? How did all of those people make the list? This is how. Because Jesus wasn't afraid to come into this world and be covered with all their sin. To be treated as if he'd done it all. That's why he stepped into the world. That's why he came Christmas. He's always traveling towards the cross in the Bible. And when Jesus was grown up into a man, he stood in in the river with all these differences. All the water there is in the river and is is washing, you know, it's cleaning them all. And there it is. And he stood there with them in the water. He's like, I am associating myself with you. I'm coming. I've been made one of you. And even though you've done terrible things, Abraham, even though you're a terrible man, Jacob, even though he's a terrible man, Judah and Ruth and Rahab and all these names, and the list goes on. They have made the list because of what Jesus has done for them. Because he's died on the cross for their sin. This church is full of bad people. Sorry. (laughs) 
If you're visiting today, it's great to see you, but it probably won't take you long to see that, especially if you look at the guy at the front who's talking to you now. We're not perfect. In fact, we're sinful. We're bad. We're selfish. So why are we here? Because of Jesus. He takes bad people and he makes them good. He has the power to change hearts and minds. And that's how anyone has made the list. Later on in the, in the Bible, God says, oh, Abraham, he kept all my commands and everything like that. And you read it, you're like, no, he didn't. But he's counted as if he did. Because he trusted Jesus, he said, Jesus has died for my sin. All the things I've done wrong, all the things that should make me be rubbed off the list, scrubbed off, not picked first, Jesus has taken on to himself all my guilt, all my shame. He's tasted my death and he's died for me. He has paid for all my sin, all my mistakes, all my failures, everything that makes me feel ashamed, embarrassed and guilty. He hung there on the cross and paid for and he's forgiven me for it all. That was Abraham's hope. That was Jacob's hope. And this is only part of the list. There is a book in heaven with names in, listed. And this is what it says in Revelation. This is Jesus talking. I will never blot out the name of that person, the person who's trusted him, from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. So let's open the book. Let's go down to P. There you are, Peggy. Isn't that an awesome thought? Your name's on the list, Peggy. That's an incredible thought, isn't it? In Jesus' book of life, and he's not ashamed to name you in front of the Father and all the angels and all the people in heaven. It's written it there, never to be rubbed out, Peggy. And if you're a Christian here today, he's got your name too. I won't go through all your names. But put your name there. It's there. How's it there? I didn't think I'd be good enough. Well, because Jesus has written it there himself, because he's not ashamed to be related to you, to, be, to become one with you, to join himself to you. He's not ashamed to do that if you trust in him, as you come as you are and say, Jesus, I've sinned terribly. Like Abraham, like Jacob, I, I shouldn't be part of your church, but you have come to rescue me from my sins. And if you've trusted in Jesus, your name is there too. That's a list I want to be on, that I am on. That's the list we should be really concerned about. If you remember when Jesus, he sent out his disciples to heal and to do all sorts of amazing things in the Bible, and they came back and they were so excited, weren't they? They said, Jesus, the, the evil spirits listen to us and, and people have been healed and all these amazing things that we'd be like, that's incredible, isn't it? Jesus, he didn't tell them off, but he said, great, but there's something else you should be rejoicing about. He said, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Peggy, we want to rejoice with you today because your name is written in heaven, in Jesus' book of life. And anyone here who's a Christian today should have that same feeling with Peggy, like it's new all over again. He's written my name. It's there. Not because I deserve it, not because I've earned it, not because I made the nice list. But because I made the bad list, that's what, that's what makes me qualify. Jesus came to save sinners. And if you know, if you feel lost, if you know you've done wrong, if you're so, he's come to save you. If you're not a Christian, your name can be in that list by the end of the service today. Next to Peggy's, if it starts with P. I don't know if it's alphabetical. But it can be there if you call on him today. But you know, it gets better than that, Peggy. Your name isn't just in Jesus' book of life. When Jesus says your name is written in heaven, it's written all over the place. <laughs> oh, it's funny to think about, isn't it, how to see that? But Jesus' book isn't the only place where your name is written. When your name is written in the book, it gets written in other places. Jesus' book isn't just like a dusty old book that sort of gets shut 
and the names are there, but they get put on the shelf, covered in dust and cobwebs, and forgotten about. No, that's not how Jesus works. The priest, the high priest in the Old Testament, basically he dresses, before Jesus came as a man, he dressed up in this amazing costume so he could try and show Jesus to the church. And do you know what he had? Two big black stones on his shoulders. Onyx, I think, is black. Is it a bit like black glass? And they were there. And on those stones, he had all the family names of everyone in the church family engraved on him. So imagine that. There's a man who's camping amongst you, because they camped in the desert, living amongst you. And whenever you see him walk by, he's got your name on his shoulders. You're remembered. You're thought of. You're cared for. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? And Jesus tells a story about a sheep that gets lost. Do you remember that one? A sheep that just wanders off away and it gets lost and it's injured, cold, hurt, dirty, smelling, all sorts of things. And what happens? The shepherd leaves the other sheep in the open and he goes looking just for that one sheep because he loves that sheep so much. And Jesus, when he finds, says, when he finds that sheep, he picks it up and he puts it on his shoulders. He shoulders that sheep. He shoulders it and all of its burdens. Can you imagine that? It's pathetic, isn't it? Tiny little sheep. It's, it's wet, it's cold, it's shivering. You can just go, ah, that's it. It can't save itself, it can't find itself. And this shepherd just lifts it up, says, that's all right, I take everything that comes with you and I'm just lifting you onto my shoulders. If it was us, we'd walk complaining all the way home, isn't it? This is giving me a backache. I'm wet now, I'm going to have to wash my posh jumper. But he says, when that shepherd gets home, he calls everyone up and he rejoices. He says, I found my lost sheep. Be happy, I found it. And that's what a great picture of Jesus. Do you remember Sam in Lord of the Rings, the films? He get poor Sam. You always feel sorry for Sam Wise, isn't it? If you've seen them. But what, he gets so desperate to help Frodo carry the ring, but he knows he can't. Remember that bit? And he's got tears in his eyes, and they're all covered in dirt, halfway up the volcano. And he does that. It's a bit cheesy, but he does that heroic line. I may not be able to carry it, talking about the ring, but I can carry you. And there's this heroic moment, isn't there, where Sam like, stumbles up the mountain and he carries Frodo. In other words, I, I might not be able to take the ring from you right now, but I can carry you. I can carry the burden that you're feeling. You haven't got the energy. You haven't got the strength or the power to go on, but I can. I can carry you. And he carries him. And, you know, they, they succeed, don't they? Mission accomplished. Jesus has carried the weight of your sin. And Peggy, your name is written on Jesus' shoulders. He's willing to carry you and all your burdens forever. Isn't that incredible? He's picked you up on his shoulders and he's carrying you. That's what he wants. Your name is written on his shoulders. He carries all our burdens. You might think, but doesn't he trip? Doesn't he stumble like Sam? No, he's God. He's got big enough shoulders to carry the burdens of the whole world. And he really did. The Bible says he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. And there's a song, isn't there, which says, he took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore my burden to Calvary. He suffered and died alone. And Peggy, he doesn't carry you grumpily. <laughs> oh, I can't believe I've got to carry Peggy to heaven. He's not like that. He delights to do it. He loves to carry you and all your burdens and all your family too. And if you're a Christian, he's carrying you. Your name isn't just in his book, it's on his shoulders. He carries all your burdens. No wonder the Bible says, cast all of your burdens, literally throw all of your burdens onto Jesus because he cares for you. If you feel overwhelmed and weighed down by your past today, you don't have to carry it on your own anymore. Jesus has carried it all for you. 
And you might think, yeah, but I, I feel completely dirty. If you know what I thought about and some of the things I've done and said, I feel completely dirty, I feel used, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. Jesus is willing to come and meet you where you are, lift you up on his shoulders and carry you all the way to heaven, rejoicing as he does it, loving you as he does it. Your name's not just written in the book of life, it's written on his shoulders. But you know, that's not the only place. It's written somewhere else. <laughs> it's written over his heart. Again, the high priest in the Old Testament, so he had this amazing costume. So he had the two big stones on his shoulders, but he had like this chest plate there, this square chest plate. And on there were 12 precious stones because there was 12 different church families. And on each stone... He had engraved the name of every church, family, and member. So when he put that chess piece on, where were they? Close to his heart. It's an incredible thought, isn't it? Close to his heart. So wherever the high priest moved, he could feel that burden. He was carrying the people all around him. But also, wherever he went, whatever he felt, it was with them on his heart. Remember that woman who came and knelt at Jesus' feet? There was like a feast going on and it was all big. All the important people of the town were invited and all the, you know, everybody was there. She just came bursting in. She fell at Jesus' feet. She was crying. She like mopped Jesus' feet with her hair and everything like that. And she, she broke some expensive perfume and poured it on Jesus. And everyone criticized her, didn't they? Do you remember that? What a waste. Why is she wasting her money on Jesus? That could have been sold and given to the poor. They're all criticizing, all muttering. All that. Do you know what Jesus said? Leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing. She was close to Jesus' heart. It wasn't that he didn't love everyone else in the room, but he wanted to make that point. You touch her, you touch me. You criticize her, you criticize me. Leave her alone. Jesus was carrying that woman close to his heart, and she was forgiven. Other people were like, if Jesus knew what she, where she'd been, what she'd done, what she said, he wouldn't let her touch him. Leave her alone. Jesus carried her close to his heart. And Peggy... Your name is written close to Jesus' heart. He loves you so much that he gave his life for you. And every decision he makes, every thought he has, is with this incredible love for you. He doesn't just make mechanical decisions, Jesus, as Lord of everything. He says, you're treasured, you're precious, you're loved. Every decision he makes, even the ones we find hard to cope with, isn't it? Where God decides something for us and it disciplines us or it shows up something we've got wrong that we have to make right. We don't like that, but he's treating us like sons and daughters. Deuteronomy 26 says this, The Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession. And Peggy, Jesus treasures you every moment. It's an incredible thought, isn't it? If you're a Christian, Jesus treasures you. He sees you as precious. You're worth more than the whole world to him. Isn't that exactly what he gave up when the devil tempted him to have you? Gave up the whole world, gave up everything for you. You're carried close to his heart. But there's somewhere else as well. If that wasn't enough, somewhere else your name is written. In Isaiah 49, the church are doubting. They're saying, God has forgotten them. Have you ever felt like that? God has forgotten me. God doesn't care. We might not say it out loud. We say, why, why is this happening to me? If he cared, he wouldn't let this happen. If he really did love me, that wouldn't be, he wouldn't arrange that or allow that. Do you know what God said? What Jesus said to the church when they were like, God doesn't care, God's forgotten. He said this, see I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your name is written on the palms of Jesus' hands. 
This one's a bit different to the others, isn't it? Our name is on his shoulders, in his book, close to his heart. This time it's on his skin. Literally part of him, isn't it? And what it means is, if you are a Christian, you are so closely joined to Jesus by his Spirit, you're literally written on him, he could never, ever forget about you. Ever. Maybe you've known the pain of other people promising stuff and then forgetting. Forgetting you even exist, not, not getting in touch, whatever it might be, you, you felt that. Maybe you do feel like God doesn't care, but he says, look, Jesus reaches out his hand and says, look, there you are. You're written there. You, I've engraved you on the palm of my hand. You're there. I can't forget you. You're part of me. You belong to me. I'm with you wherever you go, and you're with me. We're inseparable. You can't, you can't tear us apart. And in Ephesians, it says, God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Peggy, every time Jesus reaches out into this world to do something in your life, whatever it might be, you're there. Written on the palm of his hand. He can never forget you. Never forsake you. Never leave you. Your name is there. It's all over the place, isn't it? Which is incredible. That's what Jesus means when he says, rejoice, your name is written in heaven. If you're a Christian today, your name's written in Jesus' book of life. You have life. You have eternal life already. Your name is written on his shoulders. He will carry your burdens and carry you. Your name is written over his heart. He loves you. He cares for you. You're close to him and you're part of him. Your name is written on Jesus' hands. This is from an old preacher called Spurgeon during Victorian times. He said this, your name is there, but that is not all. I have engraved you. See the fullness of this. I have engraved your person, your image, your case, your circumstances, your sins, your temptations, your weaknesses, your wants, your works. I have engraved you, everything about you, all that concerns you, I have put you all together there. How could you ever say again that God has forgotten you when he's written you on the palms of his hands? There's a hymn and one of the verses goes like this. My name from the palms of his hands, eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart it remains in marks of unchangeable grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure as sure as the promise is given. More happy but not more secure. The glorified spirits in heaven. That's someone who read this passage and got it. I'll be more happy than I am one day, but I could never be more secure than I am right this second if I've trusted in Jesus. If you're a Christian, you need to remember that today as you see Peggy baptized. Your name is written all over him. You've made the list because he loves you and he's died for you. So rejoice. Be encouraged. Remember that. You're joining with Peggy as we're going to baptize her in a few moments. There is one other amazing thing that we're going to talk about just as we baptize Peggy. But I want the children to, to come up and, and join us for that. So, George, is it right if you run down and just grab them? Not literally. Tell them to come back up. Thank you. But let me, let me pray while George does that. Father, if we're honest, we can hardly believe that you'd want to write our name on Jesus' list. Or if it was, if my name was written there, Lord, I might think because of all the wrong things I do, all my sin, you might just rub it out and forget. Or get too angry, Lord, and just think, that's it. But Jesus, thank you. Anyone who trusts in you their name will never be erased. 
Thank you, Jesus, this morning. We can celebrate with Peggy that her name is in that book. Her name is on your shoulders. You carry her forever. Her name is close to your heart, and her name is on your hands. Lord, please encourage her with this, we pray. Amen. Come on in, guys and girls. Is that everybody? Everybody up? Brilliant. Okay, Peggy, can I invite you to come up to the chair, please? Is that all right? Fantastic. We normally would um, baptise slightly differently, um, and I think the first baptism was it Peggy you saw was in the sea, and she said, I'd love to be baptised, but not in there. (laughs) We said, that's fine, that's absolutely fine, and there's no pressure for that at all. Um, So here we are, slightly different to normal. So we've seen that Peggy's name is written on Jesus' list, the book of life in heaven, We've seen that her name is written on his shoulders. He's now carrying Peggy forever. We've seen that her name is written on Jesus' heart, that he loves her. And every decision he makes is out of love towards Peggy and you, if you know him. And we've seen that Peggy's name is engraved on Jesus' hands. But you know, there's one more amazing thing. This is what baptism is about. Today, Jesus is going to write his name on Peggy. That's incredible, isn't it? Today, God the Father is going to write his name on Peggy. Today, the Holy Spirit is going to write his name on Peggy. Incredible thought. Do you remember Toy Story? And this is why I want the children to be here. Have you seen the first, I think it's the first Toy Story film? Do you remember Woody, the cowboy? He has a bit of a crisis, doesn't he, all the time, Woody does, about who he is and what he's doing in life. And do you remember that one time, I think I'm right, if I remember it right, Woody's having an absolute meltdown, and he's like, nobody cares, and I don't know who I am, and I don't know what's going on in my life. I think, is it Buzz? Buzz Lightyear says to him, look at your foot. He's like, what, look at my foot? And he does. And do you know what he, do you remember that amazing moment? As he lifts his foot, what does he see? Andy, the name of the person he belongs to. And everything is okay. Peggy, in a minute we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he's going to write his name on you. And you belong to him forever. So please, afterwards, ask Peggy... Uh, she's, she's, we visited um, her this past week and she was telling us some of the worries she used to have before she knew Jesus and now how he sorted them all out. And I'm sure she'll be happy to tell you uh, one-to-one. So please do ask her. It's an amazing story. But here we go. <laughs> Peggy, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour? Uh-huh. Amazing. Well then, Peggy... We baptise you in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. Normally, what do we do when someone is baptised? Big round of applause. Amazing. Just before you go, Peggy, can I pray with you? Would that be all right? Father in heaven, we thank you. You have now written your name on Peggy. Jesus, we thank you that she carries you now wherever she goes. Lord Jesus, thank you for Peggy's life. Thank you for all the times of darkness and difficulty where you've carried her already. Thank you, Jesus, for all the confusing times that Peggy doesn't have to question because she knows that you carry her close to your heart. You love her so much. 
And thank you, Jesus, that she's never forgotten. And I pray, Lord, she would just be thrilled that you have written your name on her, that she belongs to you forever. She has life in Jesus' name. And we pray as a church, Lord, you'd help us to encourage her, help us to pray for her and her family. We thank you for them, that they can all be here today to see this. We pray you'd bless them. And Lord, anybody who doesn't know you, Lord, thank you. They just have to cry out to you. And Jesus, you can add them to the list. Lord, please help us to see how amazing you are, Lord Jesus, that you love sinners, you died for sinners, you saved sinners. And we thank you for saving Peggy. We pray, Lord, for the rest of the day she goes for lunch with the family, you just pour out your spirit on her. Give her such joy, such a thrill to be a Christian. Lord Jesus, just, just bless her and help her, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so Bless much, you. Peggy. Bless you. <laughs> Bless everyone. Thank you for being my church family. It's been lovely knowing you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I love you. you can sing. <laughs> We're going to try and sing. Um, and it's, we'll just sing this to close. This fairly new song to us as a church, but the truth of it is amazing. And it just backs up what we've heard. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. So let's stand together if we can.
joy what a joy and it's amazing that not only does Jesus save you but he keeps you as well praise God um, let me just read this verse we like to end with a verse at the end of the service and normally what we do is we raise our hands there's nothing uh, like like a uh, special thing about raising your hands it's just we just do it to say that we're receiving the word of God but let me just read the verse first and then we'll raise our hands together as a church it says this Praise be to the Lord, to God our Saviour, who daily bears our burdens. And then in that psalm, it's got that word salah, which means pause. In other words, just pause after he says that, that he's going to daily, every day, not just Sunday, but on Monday when you wake up, every day, Jesus is going to look after you. He's going to keep you on the right path. So let's raise our hands together as a church. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Saviour, who daily bears our burdens. God bless you and amen. God. Come and down and join us for tea and coffee. And there's cake today, not a buffet, because Peggy's going out for lunch, so we've got to save her appetite. But there is cake, so please come down and join us.